All right, so this has uh, been a long awaited. It's uh, one of the BRS uh, 160 updates. If you watched 52 weeks of reefing yeah. uh, and sat through like, I don't even know how many hours, like must be like 30 hours uh, of material yeah. at this point. Have you sat through that whole thing? This is the one episode that matters, right? Uh, Cause we're gonna go back and look through the whole thing. So yeah. we're gonna look at uh, like what worked, what didn't work, some things that you didn't know will ever ever happen cause I didn't actually release the information. <laughs> uh, and uh, also some things that we would have done differently. Yeah, for sure. This is like, uh five years of our, my personal experiences and how I interacted with this tank. Uh, maybe like three and a half, four, because that's how long I came. I came in at the tail end, uh, but a total like five years of yours, but both of our separate experiences combined. And uh, we're gonna talk about it right here in that first update in like eight months or so. So all that's coming up. All right, so for me, this really is like accumulation of everything we've really changed in the last mm. five years. So yeah. like when we started this thing five years ago, it was really like every single thing that we thought we knew about reefing here, like all the research, the, all the different team members here, yep. everybody we talked to, we just shared all in one thing. Things change. Oh, yeah. uh, and so what you get to see today is really kind of some of that evolution. So I'm gonna start right off with some of uh, the stuff that you just never knew happened. The uh, fun stuff. Yeah, uh, I guess. <laughs> One of which is uh, we lost all the fish really early on. This was uh, before my time. I, I, I did not, when you were talking about this, I did not know it. I had yeah. no idea. We kind of hinted at it uh, yeah. in the, like some of the videos and like on Facebook and stuff. But yeah. actually really early on, we got velvet in the tank. And this is before we had any corals or anything and mm. it just wiped out all the fish. Oh, okay. Right? Uh, and did so- you, Did you have like your spot gobies then too? And like some clowns <laughs> and- Chromies or something? I don't remember the exact fish that, that yeah. uh, were in that debacle, sadly. Mm. Uh, I know there was a, a couple of uh, purple tangs and uh, oh. the blotchy antheas, yeah. the original guys that were in there. And so for those who don't know, uh, you know, like these are videos, so we kind of like had to, uh, you know, just replace them, I guess, you yeah. know? And it was kind of early on, man. I didn't really know like uh, what we should be sharing and what we shouldn't share. Like nobody wants to show you dirty laundry. <laughs> uh, and it's only like we hinted at it, but we didn't actually say like all they lost. But now, man, is a good time to talk about it because uh, it's like that whole quarantine conversation. You know, Elliot, yeah. you can see how live uh, with him and how he handles it. Yeah. But like, hmm. I, I do it totally different now, right? Oh yeah, well, it's, yeah, we'll definitely talk about like how we'll do some of those things different. So we're definitely gonna talk about that, but like uh, that's gonna come up later in, in the episode. So today yeah. also, what else didn't you know? Uh, people ask this all the time. Yeah, this one, uh, what did you not know? Uh, and it's probably been answered in a variety of different ways, but why we switched to Triton. Uh, my answer, my understanding for that is right about the time when we were doing the BRS TV investigates on Catomorpha and refugiums, we really started to learn like what these things were capable of, especially if you light them properly. And then that was a right around the exact same time like Triton was coming out and it was this method around the primary means of filtration was a refugium. We saw how effective a refugium could be and uh, it just kind of came together and was, uh, it was like, oh, that's an interesting concept. Like uh, we see that this thing can outperform uh, a lot of other filters out there uh, in a combination of filters. It's natural. And now there's a whole method behind it that addresses trace elements and major elements and minor elements and filtration all at once. Like maybe we should try this out for the community and see if we can do it on this tank. Yeah, absolutely. So really what you got to see there, if you asked the real answer as to why we switched to Triton is because I personally got really excited about it. I just, one day, man, I saw all the puzzle pieces connect, yeah. you know, and I'm like, well, if we're not moving, uh, if, if there's no nitrate and phosphate in the tank because the refugium's working well, you've replaced all of the major, minor, and trace elements, yeah. uh, and I know it because the ICP, it tells me so. It's not just I don't have to trust anybody. What is that water change doing? What is that water change doing? Yeah, yeah I, I, like, I don't know, man. It was just like, I have to find out. Mm. And I have to let you guys know too, right? And so you can watch you know, how that transformed. And you're gonna hear a little bit more about that transformation yep. as well later. But like, that is really the heart of why we changed over, you know, is because in the middle of like, this is so cool. I need to know more about it and I want to share it with the universe. So that was a big thing. Well, it's things like that that pass that, uh, that smell test for the community. Like if it seems plausible, it, it, should, be, it should be right. Uh, and that was one of those like, 
no water changes because of you know uh, nitrates, phosphates, and minor trace elements, like you said, then yeah, this should be plausible. Let's try it out. All right, so this cool. is the big thing here too. Now, stuff you never knew, you never heard like a super straight direct answer about. You're gonna hear it right now. Okay. All right. So which <laughs> one did you like best? Oh yeah. Some get asked all the time. Triton or Zeovate? I'm gonna let you go first. Uh, Okay, so we're, we're probably differing opinion. I think I'm pretty sure we are differing opinions on this one. Triton is more my speed. Mm -hmm. Triton's my speed in that, um, you know, as far as like uh, nitrate, excess nitrates, phosphates, control, and things like that. I've got one, I personally feel connected to something that's natural when it comes to filtration. So if I'm growing something natural to that saltwater tank environment, then I feel better about it being my, my filtration approach. Mm -hmm. uh, rather than like maybe like GFO or carbon dosing or all these unknown type things. Like I'm growing uh, algae and it works for me. And then that, four, that whole four part system, it's like I've, I, know how, I know how effective dosing two part is and I know I can make big batches of it and then just forget about it. So when you get the 10 liter bottles of the four parts of Triton and I can just hook my dosers right up to it and uh, so now I'm really not touching the tank very much, that's my speed. Like I don't wanna touch the tank, I do less water changes, less frequent water changes, and my hands are kind of off the tank. So I gotta qu ask you a question though. So yeah. uh, it's not just dosing four part and running a refugium. The Triton method yeah. means that I'm only doing water changes when the test kits tell me so. So are you saying that that is a, <laughs> a, something you're actually gonna follow? No, because I didn't follow it. No, yeah. so it's really Randy's method using Triton's products and some of the, you know, their, their approach to filtration. Uh, and then, of course, then you, you're, so for me, it's like Zeovid is, uh, Triton's replacing the little blue bottles with individual elements that I may or may not need. Some I may need more, some I may need less, uh, but there is kind of like a trade-off. If I follow it correctly, I'm still doing my water changes, and I'm probably like supplementing or uh, watching for di uh, different types of elements. Maybe not as, maybe not blue bottles, but I do have, you know, some direct guidance. Am I gonna do it myself? No. Yeah. yeah. So for me, if I look at both of these two things, uh, I probably won't do either one of them mm -hmm. exactly as intended, which means like, I'm not gonna do the Zeovit method. Yeah. I'm not gonna do uh, the Triton method either. And A, the water change thing just didn't work for me. Something uh, we'll share later again in, in more detail. Mm. Uh, but the Zeovit thing, we actually ran a refugium with the Zeovit. So we kind of yeah. deviated from the beginning. So yeah. uh, you could decide how much of that really mattered in the whole mix. But for me, I will just say that I saw the best results using the Zeovit method mm. uh, between the two. Uh, they were both really good. But this is why. It's because if I was following the method of uh, the Triton, the four part absolutely really worked. The mm -hmm. refugium mm -hmm. really worked. Yep. What didn't work for me was only doing water changes when the thing told me because we didn't send them out often enough. And when we did get it back, we're just busy. And so like, mm -hmm. I don't know, the tank looks good. So I don't do it and then things die. So I saw more mortalities because I wasn't listening to the report or mm -hmm. sending it in than if I was just doing the system, the 10% water changes and stuff that came with the Zeovit, I just saw more mortalities running the, the uh, Triton system than the Zeovit. And for me, the Zeovit too, like some people will tell you like they don't really like, uh, you know, monkeying around with the tank every day. Yeah. I had never been more in tune with the tank in my entire life. Okay. So, you know, drip in the little drops in every day. And then looking back at it also, like there's parts of this that like, like I will just say it, the Germans just do not explain what they're doing very well. <laughs> uh, because some of this stuff, takes you know 10 years to like for you know the community over here to like fully understand mm -hmm. right and so what they're doing over there was uh, like adding you know really low or having running really low nitrogen and phosphorus in the tank but tons of nutrition yeah. in the tank yeah, yeah, yeah. right uh, and then you're producing you know really awesome uh, coloration and growth with that and like that's part of the thing that came into the hybrid method that we did later like we were dropping amino acids the LPS ones, the yeah. SPS ones, the coral vitalizer and all that kind of stuff in there. And we're replacing all that nutrition that we're, uh, you know, taking out and really low nitrate and phosphorate, phosphate so that you don't have all kinds of pests in the tank. And I don't know, that worked out really well for me. Mm. So in the future, I might run the whole Zeovit system, but instead of running those like rocks, yeah. 
Just I just run a refugium. refugium. That makes sense. So it's kind of a hybrid here, but like, so that's what people ask all the time here is which one do we like best? I'm going to go with Zeovid if I was actually, I guess neither one of us would run either one 100% again. Would be, it would be my method, it would be your method, kind of a mix with some of that stuff. The one, the one caveat to that is that uh, they now have the, like, the, the vibe for the rocks, right? Oh, yeah, the automatic uh, Avast Marine. Yeah, so you don't have to yeah. actually like, you know, pump the rocks every day. I haven't actually tried using that thing yet, so if that thing worked, I might actually run the rocks too. Yeah. In fact, I'm gonna retract. I, I would <laughs> okay. because you're running the whole system. Why not? Yeah. Why not? Uh, I might still run a refugium because I love them. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't know. So Zeovit for me and uh, kind of Triton for you. Triton for me, and you, I mean you were talking about the hybrid method. So what can you tell us? There's something on your list here of that stuff that you don't know. Is what was our first interaction with Worldwide Corals? Because this is your story. Oh, yeah. So uh, something that you guys probably don't know is how we got hooked up. So you guys remember we had uh, Austin Aqua Farms yeah. in here. We had Battle uh, Corals, Battle Corals, Unique, Unique uh, and it was the four of them in Worldwide, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And so for those of you who don't know, there was, uh, you know, what I basically went around is I went and like toured the entire facility here. It's like, all right, guys. You know, we're gonna promote some people here. Who's your favorite place to buy corals from? So I went to all the customer mm -hmm. service, I went to all the reefers here, and we asked where everybody's favorite place to buy corals was, and I called those people up, right? Yeah. And there's probably, uh, I don't know, a dozen of them or so. Yeah. And uh, like a handful of them got back to me. In fact, Adam at uh, Battle Corals, Battle corals yeah. like he didn't even get back to me. I just ordered like three grand worth of corals and that was enough for him to like Call hit you. me up. And, like, <laughs> hey, what's this all about, right? Uh, and so, but Worldwide Corals was actually, that was my first interaction with them. So that's something probably most of you didn't know because it's really blossomed. Uh, today, oh, yeah. I just put another dozen corals in here they, they sent us uh, out. They did, they sent us like 80 some different corals. So a bunch of them went in here and you'll see in other updates, a bunch of them went in the other tanks. Mm -hmm. but. Yeah, uh, it's worked out really well. And it created the whole WWC hybrid, uh, BRS uh, WWC hybrid method. Yeah, so by the way, uh, I, I, some of you probably haven't seen it yet, but like check out the hybrid method. It's, it's I would call it like an evolution of the 160 in some degree and like uh, it's still kind of a similar format, but like yep. we really think about it in a different way. Uh, and uh, that's kind of the method that I might think about for the future a little bit when we're talking about which ones we'd pick. But a big thank you to the Worldwide guys because they've actually put like almost all the tanks that you see around here oh, yeah. look sharp because they helped us put corals in them. That's true. Uh, and they send us out stuff all the time. They sent out like 50 shirts yesterday. So a yeah. uh, big thank you to those guys. Uh, but right on now, I think we're going to move on to what worked on yes. the BRS 160 before we get to all those fails. First thing was uh, heavy feeding with lower nutrients. So, I mean, this is... Uh, it's because the refugium works so well. So we had the refugium running, we had the H1200, big giant light, you know, heavy duty, only running it at 5% because otherwise it would just, it was the, the beam of the sun straight on this, uh, on this uh, refugium. But we started to find that it was working too well. Undetectable nitrates, nearly undetectable phosphates, and no matter how much food we shoved down this tank's gullet, it just would not raise up. So we ended up cutting it to like, three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Mm -hmm. And oh, may I think like maybe uh, 10 hours or so. It was at 12 and then 10, and I think we're right around there for three days a week. Uh, but that coupled with a whole bunch of food going in here, so different types of food too. Uh, uh, particulate food for the corals, bigger food for the fish. So basically, we're making the fish produce more waste and there's more free floating food. Corals start to and color up. Yeah, so uh, that, that's it, man, is heavy in, heavy out. Yeah. And so filtration has gotten so good these days. Refugiums work, the roller mat was working, like everything was working. So uh, you can dump food in the top, right? Uh, which means that I can feed, you know, more than just nitrogen and phosphorus to the corals, which right. is like, that's only like one component of the whole mix, yeah, right? Yeah, proteins and aminos and yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, later on again, WWC hybrid method uh, is, uh, shows that up in, in that one, heavy in, heavy out, mm -hmm. uh, and thinking about coral nutrition, not nutrients. Right. Uh, so that worked out really well. Another one that worked out uh, on this one is lighting, man. I think no matter how many times we've touched this, and we barely have, 
the it's been T5 LED combo from the get go, mm -hmm. and we've swapped out from castles to castles back to new castles. I think that it went AP 700s, yeah. then the 360s yeah. to the 360Xs. Yeah. Okay, so but the meantime, the whole time it's gonna it's been uh, T5s in there, mm -hmm. uh, AP, uh, the ATI Blue Plus bulbs, and I will tell you, at no point was lighting ever our problem. No, I don't think and so. And it was so the castles are so easy, like you're not flipping all these switches and stuff. And yeah, it looks good. The balance of the two, the shimmers right uh, once you mute it with uh, uh, the T5s. This has just been like the no-brainer one. Like you don't spend Worked. a ton of time trying to get it right each time. Mm -hmm. And just for a reference point, the reason that we switched between those three ones is the AP 700s were doing just fine yeah uh, except for the wireless link between them yeah it was you, really wonky well, yeah we had three of them so trying to connect them and digging your fingers up under there and trying yeah. to get the Wi-Fi to connect and it was just it was tough and trying to get it set for you guys so we could video it That's was the, the thing yeah. right and so we just there was no reason to change other than for video man it was a giant pain in the butt and we got like 8 million Wi-Fi devices here yep. uh, at the facility so we switched over to the 360s uh, and I was just fine with that the only reason we changed is because they came with something new, and why not? Uh, the <laughs> 360s were doing just fine, and you can you can see it in the results. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't know. And lighting uh, worked. Mm. Man, is actually the primary light being the T5s, and then the LEDs are really just there to fill it in. You know, nice blanket of light. It's muted. The shimmer's nice. Mm. Color's nice. Uh, I mean, especially with this dip the tank. So you know, mm -hmm. for some people, like four T5 bulbs on this size of tank and SPS probably wouldn't be their primary. I don't know. But this, I mean, you're talking like all the way down here towards the bottom. We're getting plenty of light down there for some of those acros to grow. Mm -hmm. So for that to be four T5 bulbs plus five castles and set it and never touch it again. Oh, easy. Uh, another thing that really worked, sharing the journey. Oh, for, for me too. Uh, this is the whole reason why I got in. And one of the, just like you guys, one of the whole reasons I got into reefing was because of this tank right here. Because I got to follow it and we got to learn every week. Uh, I got to tell you, uh, Dave and I were just sitting around one day and like, wouldn't it be cool if we set up a tank and filmed it every week and then we take all this like uh, knowledge about carbon we've been like, you know, spouting out every week, yeah. but we wrap it around something cool, like an actual tank. <laughs> uh, I had no idea what we were really doing at the time. Yeah. Uh, but now, you know, like we go to the shows and, and you know, all the people we meet are like, oh my God, thank you for the weeks. 52 weeks reefing weeks. watch. Yeah. like, oh, thank you, man. I had no idea so many people would want to watch us talk about reefing. Oh right? yeah. Uh, and, uh, but really though, like, if you watch that thing, like somehow suffer through it from beginning to end, the whole thing, uh, me rap, just talking to you. <laughs> uh, you know what? Like, there's so much knowledge there's in there. There's so much knowledge. And then it's on a journey, you get to see the whole thing. And more importantly, you get to see the failures, the wins, the losses, and uh, like, you know, tie real results to uh, a real journey, man. So that was a big win for this one for me. Yeah, and I think the most valuable episode will probably be this fail you know mm. at the end of this one is like or it, it what actually didn't work with the 160 that'll mm -hmm. be the most valuable to me i might even start there and then come back and watch the whole thing yeah but. uh really man the fails are the like where it went wrong because we thought out those things man really hard yeah. you know uh we really really try to take every bit of knowledge we had man uh and uh, share it to the best of our ability the thought process for us a lot is not chase the mythical best every time but do no wrong Right. Yeah, do no harm. If you did it this way, you would be successful. Mm. And in the end, I think that's true, but we just actually found some ways that you can be even more successful, right? Yeah. Uh, the game just evolved in five years. Oh, I, I think that some of the information in some of those episodes we've maybe changed our minds on or tweaked a little bit or, or learned more about. Uh, yeah, man. Uh, I think another one, man, it was, you already touched this a, a lot, but the Fuge was a success. Right. Oh yeah, it's totally worked. So uh, I think uh, there was there was some talk about like, should you run Skimmer and Fu or uh, Skimmer and Fuge? Should you run Zeovit and Fuge? Should you? I mean, these questions pop up all the time. And I don't. Uh, when I first got here, you had we had the Fuge, mm -hmm. and we had got this light, this horticulture light, and it was the H one, like the H three fifty. Mm -hmm. Not the 380, the 350. It was a white body one. Oh, and yeah. it was uh, one, I think it was like one color. It was like grow, it was like purple. Uh, but that thing was on there and it was growing Kato like 
like crazy. That's the chamber was a lot smaller since you cut it out, uh, but or since before you cut it out. Uh, but it was working right alongside of the Zeovit, and I don't know if we really pushed that too too heavily. There was an episode where you did the refugium, but even I, we still get comments to the, you know years later afterwards when people see the marine pier blocks and the filter socks and stuff in those chambers. You know, a lot of people were under the impression that that's what we stuck with when some of that, but there were so many things swapping in and out of there. Mm -hmm. The last one that we settled on was the refugium. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know, I mean, some of you probably haven't been around reefing for more than five years, so like refugiums are like now the thing. Yeah. Uh, they were kind of a thing, you know, prior to that too. I mean, there's like, like far from the first refugium in the universe. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, like people used them. But the thought process back then, and the, if you looked around the forums and everything, the information that was being shared, uh, for the most part, it was they need to be super mega. Oh, yeah. uh, like they need to be 50% of the size of your tank. They need to like for them to work. They need to like have all this crazy stuff. And it would make sense. Work. Yeah. Well, I guess it makes sense if you're using you know a five dollar CFL bulb. That's a piece that like once you see it in action and you like do the math and somebody says some of this stuff out loud, you're like, oh, I can't unknow that now, <laughs> right? And so when we did a bunch of the BRSTV experiments uh, on the refugiums, we found like I kind of expected to see that you would like reduce the nutrient load by like 25%, yeah. which would mean maybe 25% less water changes. I'll throw some algae in the trash and do 25% water changes mm -hmm. less for sure. But what we found was it took it all out. It was gone. Right, yeah. yeah. And yeah, like, pH was up, and right. yeah. Especially when we used a proper light, and then like, mm. well, this is the part where once you hear it, like, of course, right? We were all using a $5 bulb, you know, from Home Depot, like, mm. designed to grow a plant or whatnot. Yeah. Uh, to try to out-compete, like, the thousands of dollars of lights in the display. That and, was never going to happen. And in spectrums that the uh, a lot of the spectrum from that CFL bulb, the plant doesn't even use anyway. That doesn't use. Yeah. Yeah, and so now we use a, a lamp that is uh, as high par as the one that's in the front. Mm -hmm. uh, lo and behold, it works. Like, of course it does. And also, like, if I have one this big, uh, I can make it actually one quarter of that size if I increase the rate of photosynthesis four times yeah. uh, by using a higher power light. Yeah. They're like, oh, well, of course, right? <laughs> uh, and so refugiums, man, was big. Yeah. And, like, we put it on this one, and now you see refugiums on, like, everything. Oh, right? yeah. Like, you get the data out into the universe, and then you can, like, you know, make informed decisions on how big you want it, how big you need it to be, and how you plan on lighting it. And if it is uh, working or it isn't working well as well as you want, like, well, mm. I can buy a nicer light, or I can tune it down if I need to. I can run it. Like, in this case, it was working too well. That was one of the things, yeah. uh, and uh, we actually changed it uh, to like every other day for a while, yeah. you know, off of that. But yeah, refugium was a big one. Uh, also, uh, the uh, fourth take on electrical this, was a, a win. So, I mean, the, the intentions were good behind the first few episodes where uh, you had to start somewhere. I mean, you had to get water in there. You had to get a pump plugged in. So you had power strips like most people or some people would start. I started with power strips, regular old power strips. So let me in second here. Yeah. So the fourth take in electrical, just for to get you guys all up to speed, oh. means that uh, like we did some episodes on how to do electrical safely, yep. and they were great. Uh, but there's been like a handful of revisions since then. Uh, and you can see oh. it if you watch real close. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm sure uh, Dave will overlay some stuff here where you can see where <laughs> it's actually at now. Uh, looks but very yeah, clean. that's what I was at. So fourth take on this, man, actually uh, worked out in the end. Well, it makes sense too, because at the same time we were trying to, you were, you know, building this tank and teaching people about it. You had to, okay, now we're going to put a controller in, so I got to redo everything, and now we're going to add in these this equipment, so we got to redo everything, and it ended up being like this mass, this nasty wire of core cords, massive cords coming through the wall, uh, all the way down below beside the tank. There was all intentions of mounting a whole bunch of stuff on these really nice boards, but they were leaned up against the wall with cords shoved underneath of them, and everything on the front was displayed nice. And if there's one thing that, like, Terrence, that you, that you said you took away from Terrence, I take away mm. from Terrence too, is, you know, if it looks clean, then it's, you know, then it is clean and like it's well kept. If it looks well kept, then it's you know it's clean. It's a well, I forget. I'm butchering clean it. Clean is synonymous with safe. There you go. Clean, clean is synonymous with safe. And in which case, I, I would be willing to bet that before it, it looks like what it does now, 
there was parts in there that were not safe. For sure. For sure. Uh, so yeah, that was the big thing, man, is like we spent all those episodes getting them perfect and it was actually really nice the day that we installed it. Oh right? yeah. But like we were changing stuff all the mm. time, man. And uh, I was maintenancing pumps and taking them out and putting them in and like our solution did not, it was only gonna work the day that we did it, yep. right? And now the doors like swing open and oh, yeah. it allows for you to like remove stuff. We're using Velcro strips that are uh, easy nice. to take off mm -hmm. rather than uh, just uh, you know plastic strips or zip ties or whatnot. And much safer. Yeah, so one of the things I'm gonna share with you guys when I'm doing my build at my house, uh, which will get jump started pretty soon again, uh, is I'll share how to actually do this right the first time uh, so that when you put effort in, you get to reuse that effort mm. uh, because like it worked now, but like I guess I could put three of uh, the four try work. The three, third, first three uh, did not work. So you really got to think when I, as soon as I put this in here, this actually needs to be removed someday. How am I going to do that? Right. Right. And so mm. if you get that in there, uh, that's it. Uh, next is the return pumps. Yeah, we, we've we had two two types of return pumps on this. There mm -hmm. was the Vectra and now the Abyss. Mm -hmm. uh, so the the, uh, the Vectra worked really well. It was brand new pump. It was, it was controllable, it was DC, it's controllable. It was Quiet. blue, it was quite, I mean, it was blue, it kind of matched our form and function back there, which was really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it put out enough, we've got a manifold back there, so it puts out enough flow to, if we wanted to use the manifold for, we had the recirculating skimmer, so we had to feed that. There was, you know, uh, Reactor inputs on there, the UV sterilizer on there, the two uh, two different returns. Uh, and the Vectra M1 worked. Recently, the conversation has uh, has evolved again, thanks to Terrence, because of the redundancy of uh, a dual return pump, which we didn't know before when we were making the plumbing. When you were like mapping this thing out, it wasn't a, something that we wrapped our brain. We're like, aha! I had an aha moment. So it was the moment he said it. Yeah. It was, so there was a one pump for dual manifold. Well. It's like the heart, right? There's like one thing that's circulating the water yeah. through your display, through all of your filtration. One thing that will for sure suck up a rock or turn off or get stuck or fail yeah. or, you know, and something, man. Uh, and so like that happened actually. Uh, and you know, they just wear out, oh, right? Yeah. And so like two, now, you know, like if you put two pumps in there, now, like at we, any given time, one of these could fail yeah. and the other one would still be going, right? Well, Plug so, them into different circuits, so yeah, like GFCI can't uh, fail. It just for the cost of it versus if you're installing it brand new from the beginning, like, because yeah. uh, I, I mean, if you're probably sitting there saying, well, I don't want to go do that, we didn't either. You know, we didn't want to <laughs> recut apart our plumbing uh, either, yeah. right? So when it came time to do a pump, what, what did we do? That was where the Abyss, because they had like the 10 year warranty. These things are, you know, German manufactured. They're well made. They're known to last, just well built. We haven't cleaned this one. I don't think we've taken it off and I don't think Josh has taken it off and cleaned it. But that was one of the things that Sean for... said too. We uh, did a tour recently, yeah. like a 22 foot long tank uh, and he had all those abysses and he's like, do I they're never clean these? They're they so work. reliable, right. it's redundant in its, uh, in its own. It's the best you can get, redundancy you can get for a single pump. So for a single pump, uh, I will say the abyss actually worked. And is it expensive? For sure, uh, <laughs> uh, you know. It is definitely not a, a cheap, cheap thing. Yeah. But like, what we got going on here is not cheap either, and it's all relying on that one failure point. Uh, and so, like, you know, it, maybe it's not. We didn't even buy it the first time. You know, mm. it was uh, uh, the Vector we did the first time. Yeah. But when I realized I couldn't have two return pumps, or I was going to have to cut everything apart to do it. Like, you know what? I'm just going to buy the best available pump that yeah. I can get. And that will be, you know, the best level of insurance again. Uh, you know, now I can get warnings. At the time, I didn't have this, but yeah. uh, the Apex now has warnings. So if uh, it's not drawing power or whatnot, it'll actually tell me you're too much power or whatever. So uh, now I have a variety of different things. We still only have one pump back here. Yep. I'll never set up another system that way, but this one is still running on one pump. Yeah. So I think the, the next one that we, uh, that is working or has worked for the BRS 160 evolved out of me when I was in charge of the 160 not doing the water changes Triton told me to do. In which case, uh, if I don't have the 30 minutes or so to do a water change, we'll do it auto water change. Boom, button. 
there you go. I can program it to do it uh, continuous all day, every day, or I can push a button and do a water change. But now I don't have to be back here hauling hoses and all this. I can push a button and go back to writing scripts. This was a nice thing, man. <laughs> uh, I, sometimes I really appreciate being able to talk to a couple of people at the top of different areas. Like I hit up Terrence and Kurt and I'm like, dude, like you have this great auto water change system, but there's so many people doing Triton now, like they don't want it going all the time. Mm. Well, like, is there a way for you to just set it up so I can just go and push a button and we'll do a 30 to a gallon water change or whatever I say? And it's like, well, not now, but there will be. Yeah. And in a matter of weeks, man, they had, like released a new firmware. So for Triton users out there, like who want to listen to the report but don't really have the time, yeah, that's true. walk up and hit the button. Yeah. Right? Uh, and eventually, you know, we just decided, you know what's even easier than that? Just doing them anyway. You know, yeah, just keep just like we have huge bats of water around here. So. Just keep a constant ten percent. Uh, or I think it's like three. It's like three percent a day. Yeah, it works out to be like you know, ten fifteen percent a week or something. I don't, I don't know. know. Yeah, but but a three percent a day just happens all the time. I don't have to send out the reports. I don't have to push the button. It just happens, <laughs> and like it's just uh, actually easier in the end. But uh, auto water changes, man. That has been like a systemic win. Uh, it goes around it's, to all the tanks it's in, here. It, it's in the 750, your, your ULM tanks, all the tanks back in the lab with ongoing experiments. If it needs a water change in that experiment, it's hooked to auto water change. It's, it's, uh, it takes so much time off of so many people. I'd call it the ultimate stabilizer, man. Like, there's so many things that can go wrong with your tank. Chemistry can get off, contaminates from your hands, lotion, motor oil, who knows, man. Like, somebody could have sprayed Lysol near the mm. tank or whatever. Uh, and, like, one little bit of Lysol, you know, maybe not enough to actually harm anything. But, like, maybe somebody's been doing it, like, every week for the last yeah. uh, six months. You never know. But maybe that never catches up because I'm taking 3% out every day. So all those unknowns that are happening, man, are actually not building up anymore. And it's just the ultimate correction factor. So mm -hmm. if you can do it, the auto water change thing, man, just totally changed the game for me. It also makes sure that I do them in the winter, I do them in the summer, I do it like when work is hard, I do mm -hmm. them when work is easy, I do it like all the time because it's just, I just, all you gotta do is go like once a month, go dump a bucket of salt in the thing, mix it up and move, go yep. on about your day. Yeah. You know, it's super super easy now so auto water change like uh this was probably the biggest win uh from a personal lesson for me and a lot of people think i can't do it or whatnot but oh. you can run the tubes through the ceiling you can run them along the floor or in a like a little you know cord hider you can run them outside and then back inside you can go through the basement yeah. and back up uh, some of ours are going 50 feet like 20 feet up and 50 feet over yeah you know so uh, so in the have, lab, they're going all around the whole room, man. Yeah. Like, it's just it's huge. It's awesome. Yeah, so auto water changes is a big, big, big one. Uh, yeah, for sure. Another and, one. Uh, the other one is uh, pegging the calcium reactor concentration. So probably uh, this is something we one. wanted to test for a long time. Uh, so we ended up testing it. Like, do uh, if you peg the pH, uh, can you then just adjust the flow? of how fast you're dosing that concentrated solution and turn a calcium reactor into something super complicated for a lot of people to not complicated at all. I set a pH and I just adjust a dial, up or down. Yeah, so for a lot of you out there like have contemplated a uh, calcium reactor, I gotta tell you, like, they look really confusing. All the information how to run is kind of like tribal knowledge and from like individuals. Mm. Like there wasn't like a real collective way in how to do it and it was like uh, universally shared. I will just tell you that here, uh, we found a way that works really easy. Uh, and uh, I don't know, man, this is the way I would do it every time. <laughs> so uh, all you do is peg the pH inside the reactor using a controller, yep. right? And so. If it's a 6.5, you know, the concentration, the DKH is like 40. Yeah. And now it's just a one part machine, right? Dose is calcium and alkalinity. And it's just how much I dose. And you can use a, a continuous duty dosing pump if, if you want. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Camor has been the big one. I think the one from uh, Ecotech that's yeah, coming out here some. will probably be a really popular yeah. option. You can also just use a valve too if you want, as long as you're willing to like kind of check it and make sure that it's actually you know doing the right dosage or whatnot. 
But like now the concentration, if you can just think about this is uh, I'm gonna peg the concentration at 6.7, it's 25 dKH, it's at uh, 6.5, it's 40. And you'll have to go to one of his videos to see where it actually landed, but it doesn't actually matter because you can just peg the concentration and then go on your specific tank, find out if it's going up or down. If the levels are dropping, just like two part, all you do is tell it to dose like a little bit more every yeah. day, right? It's just so simple. And so, I actually crossed the boundary to the point that in my own tank, I'm almost certain I'm going to use a calcium reactor. It's just so easy. Yeah. And in fact, I think now easier than managing buckets of two part and, you know, keeping them clean and stuff like that. So I don't really know. It will definitely be either BRS two part because it's just simple. Yeah. Uh, or in like one of the updates you're going to see is the two part uh, ULM or I guess the hybrid method mm -hmm. in my office. This has been the most successful tank that we've Just seen forever. Just two-part, yeah. So I'm kind of tempted uh, to <laughs> emulate that. But the uh, calcium reactor is so easy now. Uh, if all you got to do is peg the pH in there and then figure out how much you're going to dose every day. Oh, yeah. I don't know. And there's calculators even for that now. So uh, I don't know. That was a really big win because I think we just like totally took this really complex thing with all these moving levers, Turn illuminated one lever, and now all it is is how much you dose. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, easy. So that was uh, really, really cool. Uh, and related to that is the Trident. Yeah, the first one in-house here, Terrence sent to me, and I gave it to the 160. No, mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to try this thing out for sure, and the one prime candidate right here, we figured out ways that we can use the Trident. One, uh, especially like when you're messing around with different pHs or you see different pHs, you see different consumption rates and stuff too, but just having my alkalinity, it's especially, a, this tank is what, going on five years old now and some of the corals in here we would hate to lose. So just having another alert on my phone, uh, specifically when it comes to, I can do something immediately about it, like my alkalinity is going skyrocket or it's tumbling or what have you, uh, just another, uh, mechanism for me to like keep this thing running so it turns into a five-year tank can turn into a ten-year tank for alkalinity specifically oh yeah like if you can watch the trends of how your corals calcify and how they react to lighting changes and you know feeding changes mm. and temperature changes almost all of that will show up in the alkalinity and then like just the peace of mind of knowing this like not just daily but like hourly and watching it stabilize like I don't know, man, like uh, for me, uh, I guess I don't really need the calcium and magnesium one, but I will definitely take it. Yeah, it's there, uh, yeah. The, the alkalinity one, man, is like a mm. dream come true. So uh, that was actually a big thing that worked on this one. This one kind of came like after the series was started. I threw this in here though, because like, uh, I think it's a pretty big win on the system and the stability because it's only stable as how stable you know it is. Yeah, uh, so if I'm not testing or, it's, I never thought I would want to know alkalinity more than four times, more than once a day. And now I'm getting it four times a day. I love it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm just one step ahead. If I miss a day, I don't have to worry about it. This has got my back. Actually, you probably did see some of the updates in here mm -hmm. where like I shared, especially when I was doing uh, the Zeovit and I was doing the drops, I might as well write down the alkalinity, the checker so easy. Yeah. Uh, and when I was doing uh, the alkalinity daily, the measurements, quality of the tank went up because I was so in tune with the tank knowing the alkalinity that way. Yeah. And so actually prior to the Trident, man, is where like I really got the value of understanding if you did this every day, you know, and eventually it kind of like scales off, but like for a new reefer or a, and a, you know, even actually a fairly advanced reefer uh, that's doing like a SPS tank for their first time, you know, like this gives you a reference point to how your tank's doing it goes way, 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 way beyond uh, anything else. So, yeah. Uh, that, that is a big one. All right, so another one that worked really well for me, man, and people were super, super uh, cautious uh, about this, and I'm getting less cautious every year, to be oh, honest, yeah. right? Because they're getting better ways to do it. It's hooking your RODI system directly up to your sump to replace auto top off water. Yeah, this uh, is this is a win for me. I don't have to carry it. Like normally I had a five gallon, either a five gallon bucket or some kind of five gallon. Five gallons, five to 10 gallons was about the reservoir size, which, you know, for like my 100 gallon tank or a 90 gallon tank, that's probably once a week topping that thing off and then trying to remember that once a week. And if I miss a week of water changes, that's not terrible, but I cannot miss a week of topping off an ATO reservoir. Yeah. just run dry. 
So this is like stability to me, right? Uh, like so, the salinity is always, which means all the, uh, it's always on. So all the other elements are on along with it, or at least mm -hmm. not going off because of that. Uh, and then the question really is, is like, is the worst the 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 work and the effort g going into to solve this actually worth it? And inside of like a week or a month, the answer is no. Yeah. But if I'm going to keep this tank up for five years, and if I think about the amount of times I'm going to be hauling, you know, buckets of uh, top off water to the tank, uh, yeah, dude, I will absolutely put some effort into <laughs> replacing all of that work. Right? Yeah. Especially because if you can raise your hand and say, like, I've never let my top off no, fail, I can't. I can't raise my hand <laughs> to that. You know, I've never let it not, not or empty rather. Uh, so yeah, I don't know, man. So you got your float valve, you yeah. got your little mechanical float valve, you got your some alarms, you got like a solenoid you can put on your apex, you got like you know a solenoid that goes on to uh, the uh, ATO from Tunes, uh, the oscillator. Mm -hmm. Like, there's all kinds of different ways to make sure that this thing is, is safe. And, you know, if all four of those things fail on you all at once, then I guess it, it could flood in, in your house. So you should be aware. But, like, uh, you know what, man? Like, there's never any water supply attached to my fridge. Uh, and I don't, every time that I go get water, I'm not like, Paranoid is it going it's going to burst. Yeah, exactly. You know? mm -hmm. So, like, sometimes there's like we take these calculated risks all over our house, like the, every single faucet, or yeah, everything. Yeah, it right? all works the same. Go yeah. Ahead. So, like, uh, I don't know. Uh, if I put four redundancies in, and I never, ever, ever have to haul around another bucket of uh, top-off water, I'm totally in. Especially when I'm committed to having this tank for many years to come. Oh, yeah. uh, and this was a total win on this tank. <laughs> Uh, I'd say another win that we found on this tank, uh, and we started with other tanks. So it's, I've, it's we did run into fluke, uh, uh, brapsis, mm -hmm. and we, we ran into some pests and algae issues in this tank. Like everybody does, uh, the bryopsis got unruly in here. Um, and so we tried, you know, the fluconazole treatments. Like uh, we've tried some of the reflux. The, yeah, the reflux for over the counter for the hobby stuff. A lot of people works for a lot of people. It worked here. It worked here. Good um, point. But then we needed a, we, we needed a heavier, harder, more you know more heavy dose, uh, heavy duty stuff. So we got we sourced out uh, um, what, U, U, USP grade type. Yeah, really yeah, so pharmaceutical I'm, I'll make grade. sure that Dave finds a bottle and posts it uh, in the video. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly what it was called or where we got it again, but uh, by the time this is released, we'll make sure it's up there. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it was like a special fluconazole. Uh, it's not dramatically different. It was just something that Josh at WWC recommend to us, and it comes in a bigger bottle, USP yeah. grade. And it took our Josh, the maintenance guy, so uh, we ran it. We ran its course as you should. Like you, I think you run it, run it for a week or a couple weeks, uh, and then you do water changes and you get it out. And we did that, and we'd see it die back. But then we'd see it come back again, and we'd see it die back, and we'd see it come back again. So I told, I think we were sitting in our meeting, and he was beating his head against the wall about how to kill it. And I said, well, let's do some, let's do a back to back type of treatment. Let's let's just hit it full force back to back. If it looks like it's gone, just keep the treatment going and then we'll uh, completely water change afterwards. And so far it's held it back really well. So that's been, I think it was the mistake, is you watch it like almost get eradicated, right? But there's still like patches of it all over the place still. Like they're just really small. Mm. They're like that isn't where you let up. That's actually where you uh, kick it down. Oh yeah. Right? Uh, and so just eradicate it from your system. Just give it another dose and just get it out, mm. right? Uh, I will say there's other solutions now, but that actually, you know, worked really, really well. Uh, the one thing I will say is, you know, people say it has like no impact on their tank. Some people maybe said it does, I don't know, mm. but like, I will tell you when we dosed it, we saw alkalinity consumption in the, in the tank drop, which means the corals were mad. And that just kind of gets into, you know, the mindset that we can't actually see, mm. you know, how healthy our corals are. They're not a, you know, you know, kid or a puppy or whatever that can tell you when it's hurt. Right. You know? Right, right. Uh, and so, like, that was actually where the trident kind of comes in is, like, we can see the actual alkalinity consumption, you know, drop, meaning the levels are actually rising mm -hmm. based on the same dose. Yeah. Right? So, like, if the, if the levels are stable with our dose and all of a sudden they're rising, that means the corals aren't taking Stopped as much as they used yeah. to, right? And so when we dose the fluconazole, I have seen a pretty significant uh, increase in alkalinity, which means uh, it was taking, the corals are taking up less. 
And so it just gets healthy in mindset that like nothing is like totally inert. It's just not so toxic that you're adding Drano to the tank and everything's gonna die. Right? Yeah. It isn't that. But uh, I think this mindset kind of goes like way beyond uh, just fluconazole or anything else. It's like everybody out there says, uh, I use red slime remover, it was great. And another person says it killed everything. Well, like where were you in that health scale? Because you really don't know. Oh yeah, you know? for and sure. Then, like, one thing would just like kick it over the edge. It's you a know? tipping point, yeah, yeah, for sure. So fluconazole was a huge win in here, way better than all the other like silly things we were doing before, yeah. uh, you know, magne magnesium and stuff. I can go on and on about all that stuff. Uh, one of the things that worked on the 160 that increased calcification was uh, working with higher pH, and that came from the CO2 scrubber or CO2 controller type. Uh, Mm -hmm. This is an office space. Lots of people breathing in here. Lots of, uh, in the weekend, the pH, we'd see it go up because nobody was here. During the week, we'd see the pH drop. Uh, but it really, wasn't in the, it really wasn't until we hooked the scrubber up that we saw like, hey, our, our uh, alkalinity dosage for like, I think we were on two part back then. Uh, we had to increase it because yeah. it's not keeping up. Alkalinity is dropping. We're dosing by hand here, right? Yeah. And so we were dosing by hand. This is during a period we're using the alkalinity checker every day, you mm -hmm. know, to uh, test alkalinity. And so everybody knows that we're supposed to like maintain our tanks at 8.3 or whatnot, right? Like, I don't know. I never really felt like it was worth the amount of effort. Chasing it down. You know, chasing it. Because yeah. like most of the chemicals out there like don't work that way. Kelkwasser does to some degree. Two-part kind of does to some degree. But like if you're already using those things in the intended uh, manner, uh, like there's like only so many things that go. All the pH buffers of the world are uh, garbage. Yeah. And they'll actually hurt uh, most things uh, more than help. And so like, I just didn't feel like chasing the dragon on this one was actually gonna be like super helpful, right? Mm -hmm. But when we put that CO2 scrubber media on the skimmer, like We're instantaneously, testing. like, oh my God, man, the alkalinity is dropping, yeah. right? Yeah. Like overnight. Uh, and like, where's it all going? And, like, you know, some theory, well, at a higher pH, maybe there's more precipitation. Like, Couldn't find was, it. Wasn't true, yeah. man. Didn't show up anywhere. We later on, it was the, like the birth of a whole uh, BRS TV investigates that Randy did on higher pHs. Mm. The stuff grows like 50% faster at that high pH. It absolutely works, yeah, right? Uh, so, and it, it like matches like all known science on the you know topic as well. Like we have fewer uh, uh, hydrogens inside of the coral's tissue, means less uh, carbonic acid, which like means uh, ultimately with the, car with the carbon dioxide, uh, it means there's a lower pH inside the solution. And if we can get rid of it and help free the coral of all of that stuff, we can actually increase the pH inside the coral, which can calcify faster. We see this stuff like in the ocean. We all know the effects of uh, acidity on the ocean. Stuff's mm -hmm. all been super well documented. Now we have it in the tank, we have a better understanding. So the CO2 media on the skimmer was something that absolutely worked. Oh yeah, and, uh, and it also involved that conversation be around like what we can do with the trident. So the trident didn't exist back then. Uh, and there was inklings of like some of these al alkalinity monitors and stuff out there that were coming out. But with the fluconazole and with that CO2 stuff, like you were saying, uh, if we're able to monitor, you know, this alkalinity uptake and, uh, and, you know, decrease or increase in that uptake, then we can really start to play with different things like maybe lights or maybe scrubbing CO2 or maybe changing my refugium. There's all these little tweaks that we can do and then watch that alkalinity and see what happens. Mm -hmm. All right, so one last one, man, that worked before we get to all the stuff that didn't work, uh, or the fails, I would say, <laughs> uh, is dry rock. Oh, right? yeah. Okay, so this is a, actually an interesting one for okay. me, because uh, dry rock is absolutely harder to use than uh, wet rock that like, came out of the ocean and has been mm. pre-cured and all that kind of stuff. Right? You start from nothing, yep. basically. But you don't have all the pests on it and stuff. And this was actually a really interesting one. For those of you that watched uh, like one of our like recent, uh, like the Vibrant mm -hmm. and the UV uh, sterilizer yep. investigates, we had six tanks. Three of them start with dry rock. They got like hair algae and like common Chrysophytes, stuff. Like Chrysophytes, Chrysophytes. Yeah. The ones that came out of tanks, they were actually live, man. Like Ova. just like 
an explosion of <laughs> LG in all three of them. And it was, you know, three dry versus three not uh, or live. And it was the exact same replicas of each other. All across the board. Yeah, yeah. like an explosion of algaes and all kinds of them. And, and even when one die off, some other crazy one would take its yeah, place, true. right? Hair algae, I don't know where that comes out of. Like a magic uh, hair algae uh, uh, fairy, but like it was such a big, big difference. Like, like I don't want to use that. And that doesn't even think about like no. all of the coral pests and stuff that could come on it. Right? Yeah, and that the coral pests, any just like aptasia, just unwanted pests and things like that. But uh, you know, when we're looking at the test that we did, the old mature rock, the uh, that we used versus the dry rock, that that type of algae, and it's probably different on who knows what it's a crapshoot maybe on what you'll get on mm -hmm. some of that uh, mature rock. But in this case, it was ulva, and ulva is super hard to eradicate. It's like almost, almost impossible. Uh, so the vibrant worked to some degree on it. There's probably some other things that we, we didn't really test on, but as far as like hair algae versus that algae, if I was going to choose, if I was going to choose like I had to have one or the other, I could get rid of hair algae, but visually too, the rock had nothing on it. Yeah, in both cases. So even the live rock just looked like they live rock. Didn't have any algae on it. Could they, you would visually. never guess what it would. Have it come was on in it. a dark area of some for like years. Yeah. Right. So uh, that said, I mean, live rock doesn't even really exist anymore, and it uh -huh. probably won't. You know. So like, it's really, really hard to get your hands on actual live rock. Uh, like came out of the ocean that way mm. uh, at, at this point, so it really doesn't matter. You can definitely get like cured rock yeah. there, you know, fish store or whatnot has like, you know, held it for some amount of months in water or, you know, live rock that you had in a different tank. And there's no question, no question, uh, that is an easier rock to start your tank with. Mm. You'll be able to get up to speed much, much, much faster with that type of rock than you would with uh, absolutely dry. And by faster, I mean many months, in fact. Oh, right? yeah. But in, in this case, man, I, I gotta tell you, like every single tank that you've seen us ever do has all been dry rock. So like, there's a lot of debate, like can you use dry rock, can you cannot? And I, I think a lot of the failures that happen out there, or challenges anyway, are the ones like, if you treat dry rock like you treated uh, wet live rock in the past, the chances that you succeed go way, way, way down. Especially in those SPS systems. Kind of got to know what you're getting into. Yeah, especially in those SPS systems that we mm -hmm. found. Like, uh, we use your ULM, we'll talk about this in the ULM update too, but just in a case in point, using the live rock in your ULM, it was, it was already, you know, cured, it was ready to go, and the SPS corals in there are thriving. Mm -hmm. uh, if, we, if we've tried SPS corals in dry rock that it went through the cure, and they just struggle. They seem to, like, have to take a year or a little over a year, maybe even two years, before the SPS really starts to find its its groove. Yeah, it's definitely a, a longer path, and you, there's lots of different things you can do to help make that path like easier. Uh, but like just knowing it uh, is part of it. But like, there's no question, man. Like uh, the, we used dry rock here it was like cement, man-made rock. It was painted purple. It looked good from uh, day one. Yeah, day one, you could see it in there. It looked fine. Uh, and I think actually the epoxy on that rock actually flaked off uh, over time, which <laughs> was kind of disappointing. But it just got replaced uh, by. Coraline yeah, algae. there's tons of coralline in there. Yeah, and so like I would call that work. So here's the thing: all of the stuff we talked about were the things that worked. Yes. The list of stuff that didn't work is actually even longer, man. <laughs> uh, uh, there's all kinds of different things here that we wish we could have done better. That's if true. I could do it over again, I would do. And so that's actually going to be episode two of this series. Next week we're going to come back and, and we're going to share with you guys. Fails. All the things that were wrong, all Best the fails, part. all the stuff Best that we part. wish we would have done better. Uh, so you see that uh, next week. So hit this link that showed up right here and uh, come back and join us next week because uh, it will be right here in the playlist. You'll be able to see all of the 52 weeks of reefing. So thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week.